Is this something else? Oh, uh, what music theory hacks do you need to write a great bass line? Put the kettle on, make a cup of tea, settle in. I'm gonna show you my method right now. Happy Theory Thursday, I'm Ray Harmony and this is the Hack Music Theory Show where we teach you how to hack music theory and make great songs. Alright, it's time to take this party down into the basement. Um, we're going to be doing baseline today um, for the chord progression uh, we, we went through in the last video. Uh, since then, you'll notice uh, this guy and this guy are new. Uh, so we we had another session. We wrote a uh, vocal line um, and a backing vocal line. Um, so we'll be doing uh, the vocal line um, not in the next video, which will be guitar. We'll be doing it in the one after that. Um, so as much as I want to play that for you, I think I'm going to keep it out for now. Uh, let's focus on what we are here to do, and that is the bass. Uh, so just to run through quick of uh, everything as it stands, uh, and then we'll. We'll get down into that into that low end. Bass face. That's it. I get very excited with the, the bass, so um, I play guitar. Um, I play bass too, but um, I really enjoy playing bass more than guitar. But that's a little secret. Um, okay, so here we go. I've got the chords. I've just pulled the chords out. So this is what we did last week. like that. Very pretty looking. I right, like all those lovely inversions and sus chords, everything all nice and smooth. Um, so now what's what's interesting as well is we no longer have a blank canvas. We now have something very much painted on our canvas. Um, so now it kind of shifts into like working in a kind of complementary way because um, now we need to come up with something that works with what we already have. Um, okay, so I'm just going to copy this guy down into the bass. So we're now on the bass track. And I'm just going to go into this. Okay, so this is actually the bass. Um, we don't want chords on the bass. Uh, you can kind of play chords on the bass. Um, usually, well, usually just kind of harmonies. You could play like two notes at a time. Uh, it's Because the frequency is so low, it tends to just be like a huge uh, rumble, like a monster in the basement of your song. Um, so that's quite a good line. I might use that in a lyric. Um, so we don't like monsters in the basements of our songs. Um, so we tend to just use one note at a time in the bass. So we're looking at a purely melodic um, approach for the bass here. So what we want to do first um, is just get rid of all the harmony um, and leave only the root notes for each chord. So the first chord, uh, if you remember, was E minor, E, G, B. I'm just going to delete these two guys. So this is our E. Then we went to, uh, what was it, B minor. So that's the root up here, B, and then D, F sharp, these guys down here. I'm going to delete them. So now we just have the E to the B, uh, and then we went to G major, so this is the root. So I'm going to delete this guy, I'm going to delete this guy. Then we went to A major, that's the A there, so I'm going to delete these guys, delete this guy. Uh, stayed on A, so these guys can go. And then we went to D major, which is... Up here, that's the root there. So I'm going to delete these two guys, delete those, uh, and those. Okay. 
Um, and this is our, uh, I'm just going to join this, join this. So this is just all the root notes um, that we have remaining now. Um, have a listen to this. Okay, so um, honestly, that's kind of where baseline making stops in most um, most popular music songs. It's it's just like it's a it's a root note fest, um, a, a big old a big old root note party where the only people that get invitations apparently to the to the basement are the root notes from every chord. Um, so that is. Um, I don't know, it's fine, I guess. It's not very interesting. Um, you really want to make a bass line that is going to stick in people's heads. Um, there's no reason to waste a layer in the music um, with something that's not actually bringing any value to your song. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. Uh, so here we go. Uh, what I'm thinking, I'm just going to grab all these guys. Um, so first thing you want to do is actually uh, mute the root notes okay and then I'm just gonna pull them down to that uh, yeah okay so um, so now I have invisible root notes so these guys are all muted um, this is really helpful when you're writing a bass line though um, it's, it's really helpful when you're writing any melody um, so we can do the same thing uh, in the vocals and the guitar as well. Um, what you want to do is keep a muted version of the root notes in place because what that does, it shows you the harmonic rhythm. Okay, so remember harmonic rhythm is how long you stay on each chord, uh, essentially where you change chords, right? Um, so you can see the harmonic rhythm here, it's going from there to there, it's like longer. And then remember we kind of doubled um, the speed here. Um, and then actually we did have this guy was played again, even though it's the same chord and then um, up to there. So harmonic rhythm, um, how fast or slow the chords are changing. Um, that's really important because what happens is if you don't know the harmonic rhythm uh, absolutely exactly. So for example, um, if I was perhaps moving up to this chord a little bit early like that um, in, in in the chords so um, the chords are being played on that Rhodes organ so if the Rhodes actually goes to the chord here and then what happens is uh, when I'm doing the bass I haven't copied the root notes over um, and muted them like this so I don't have that template of the harmonic rhythm what can happen then is I'm writing a bass line um, and I actually put in a note here in the bass um, that is going to clash with the chords because the chords are changing just before the bass thinks the chords change. Um, and I hear this very often in in a lot of popular music. Uh, it's usually with the vocals, um, uh, but it, 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 it happens everywhere with any instrument. It could be a synth line um, it could even be the guitar to the bass where you can hear that the the two instruments either the two players or potentially um, the person programming them uh, has lost track of the, the harmonic rhythm and you end up with this moment of clashing because the two two different parts are playing different harmonic rhythms so there you go you always want to get your root notes over um, and mute them so you have your harmonic rhythm template. Now we are totally rock solid to, um, to move into making our, uh, our bass melody. Okay, um, so I've still got the chords there. Um, I'm going to stick it in the sixteenths. Um, when uh, so when we were kind of listening to the chords and we were trying to think about 
what the bass wanted to do underneath that, um, which is always the way you want to start, right? You want to let the music tell you what it wants. Um, it will always tell you what it what it needs. Um, so we had to listen to these chords, and it was m really moving slowly, and because of all the inversions and sus chords, it's just, it's really kind of, you know, moody and brooding and um so we were kind of thinking having like you know a really contrasting bass line um where it's almost kind of jumping um and bouncy uh and syncopated okay syncopated means accenting the off beats so accenting those those weaker beats um and the the most common example of that is in reggae, where you get that accent on the offbeat, um, and that kind of gives it the, um, that reggae skank. You know, that kind of gives it uh, that that feeling of of being kind of alive in between those beats. Uh, when you have music that's all very much on the beat, uh, it's very conforming, um, and it sounds very unified um, in a boring way. So when you have syncopation, it's kind of like all these little troublemakers popping up to say hi in between the the beats. Um, and it's super fun, especially on the bass. So I was I was really hearing um, uh, let me put it in. This is what I was hearing. Starting off with like a super quick data. Um, actually, I think we're still an octave high. There we go. That's better. Um, bass. How low can you go? Um, and that's actually a very important question. Uh, if you are trying to write a bass line um, that you want it to sound uh, more real, like it was actually played on a real instrument, uh, then what you want to do, um, other than obviously getting a more um, live sounding sample, um, um, got a nice, um, it's like a, a kind of a jazz bass sound here. Um, so um, what you want to do is make sure you do not go below E, um, which is, I believe, some um, some digital audio workstations. I think um, seem to have slightly different approaches to the numbering of like C1, C2. Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, I've been told that, uh, but. Either way, um, you want to make sure that you are at the, the lowest E that your sample um, can play. Um, and for this one, it's it's the C2. Um, sorry, the E2 up there. Um, and then uh, that's going to give you the sound of a four string bass, which is like the standard bass. Uh, you could go down to a B, which is super low. Uh, a B is um, what a five-string bass can go down to, so um, that's a way to program your bass lines and to write your bass lines. Uh, more importantly, uh, to make them sound actually real, like a real bass player um, played them. So um, for here, because I'm playing in a standard-tuned six-string guitar, my lowest note is E, so we've got a four-string style bass playing along here. So we have made sure to not go below this note here, okay, to stick to the range of the instrument. Um, okay, so this is what I was hearing. Um, this, and then this. Check this out. So I kind of wanted to start off with a little double punch, right? Um, but then like having three in a row would have been like too much, like da da da. So I wanted like a little a little break, um, and then this guy here is is really syncopated because he's coming in on the fourth note here of that first beat. Okay, so I'm talking about sixteenth note sixteenth notes here, 
Um, so we're taking every quarter note um, or crotchet, we're taking every one of these and dividing them up into four. Okay, so um, I'm playing the first, the second, skipping the third, and I'm playing the fourth. And that's like this guy really kind of gives that bounce, that syncopated bounce. Okay, now um, this is kind of the obvious thing to do. You go, okay, so we just copy and paste that, right? Okay, and here we go. Okay, what just happened? We just kind of lost our, our little grooves of like the two and the one, right? Because here, 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 suddenly we've got threes. We didn't really want threes. Um, we purposefully wanted the two and the one to get that syncopated feel. Okay, so this is when we came up with a cool idea. Um, we thought we were actually going to use a little uh, polymeter. So a polymeter, um, meter is just another word for time signature, um, which is like the, the template of, of the the timing in your song which um, you compose within um, and we uh, you know so most popular music is in 4-4 four, four, so you have four quarter notes um, and that's kind of you know what you nod along to so it's one three, four, one two three four one okay um, so what we wanted to do was create um, a little uh, a naughty little extra time signature that's like kind of living just on top of that. It's like um, those, uh, what are they, like hippopotamus? Yeah. Um, and they have those little birds on top. So we wanted, uh, we wanted a little, a little, uh, a little polymeter bird sitting on top of our big, big hippopotamus 4-4. Four, four. Um, and this is how we did it. So we were thinking we definitely want a space open here okay um, and then we were kind of thinking well if you want a space open here then if you count that you got one two three four five and we we're like okay that's pretty cool so we've got five sixteenth notes check this out so we copy this over here and now what we have is two cycles through of the time signature 516. So we're going one, two, three, four, five, and then the same pattern again, one, two, three, four, five. Okay? Um, and that creates a huge amount of syncopation and a huge amount of funkiness and interest and movement in in the bass and we haven't even moved off the same you know we haven't even moved off the e we're still on the root note check this out and you can even so now we're thinking okay this is sounding cool now we just to get a feel for like where we're going and let's just move that pattern um to all the notes. So that's the B. This is the G. Um, and that guy's kind of overlapping. I'm just gonna get rid of that guy. And then we're gonna move this to the A. Um, and then we actually no, I think I think we did. I'm just undoing, undoing. Um, I think we did actually keep that guy. Um, and then, yeah, so we kind of uh, actually used the same the same rhythm starting from each bar. So this is like the first bar, four beats, and that's the second bar, four beats. So we actually did keep this going. Um, and then what we did is we copied the whole thing and started again from here, um, which is, this is the fourth bar now um, uh, but obviously the no changes here so this would be a good example of where if we weren't totally sure of the harmonic rhythm we could end up actually making a little mistake here because this guy is actually the A the, the chords change there and the same here this guy here 
actually needs to be um, a D, okay, because the chords change there. Um, and and that's a cool thing with having the muted uh, harmonic rhythm in you know those root notes um, down here. As you're writing a bass line, you just keep checking that you're um, still changing in exactly the same place. Okay, check this out now. Um, Okay, now things are starting to take shape. Um, we definitely have the uh, the direction. Uh, we've got the overall groove ready, uh, so things are looking and sounding really good. Um, the The reason we didn't want to repeat repeat the the five sixteen again, um, and I, I can actually show you. This is. So we repeat it again, so that's one, two, three, four, five, and this is the new one, two, three, four, five. Check this out. So as you can hear, I'll play it one more time. When it goes into that third one, this group here, when it goes into the third group of, of five sixteen, it it totally loses um that that groove it becomes like kind of too much of a good thing and you go a little bit numb to it um so getting rid of that just having two groups of that that makes it really special it's a real feature um and this often happens with um with motifs right because that's what we're doing against so as we spoke about in in the the last video uh we're motif hunting um, a motif is a short musical idea, uh, and they tend to pop up when you least expect them. Um, they're they're kind of like uh, little garden gnomes, and you've got to go you got to go hunting for them and find them. Um, and when you find them, don't kill them. They're like our best friends. Uh, when you find them, uh, you want to use them in other places within uh, the melody, um, or even you know the chord progression you're writing. So we've got our little uh, rhythmic motif, because a motif can be melodic or rhythmic. It's a short musical idea, so it could be something like this, that da 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 right? A little 5.16 polymeter, that's a motif. Um, or it could be a melodic motif, where, um, you know, we, we actually had that in the, um, in the chords. Let me show you real quick. This was that... Um, the two and the three, and then the two and the three. So over that A major and that um, D major, we created a little bit of melody through those sus chords. So um, so that would be, um, it's kind of a, a rhythmic motif as well as a melodic motif, um, but um, really that's, that's more of a melodic motif, the, the second note over the chord to the third note, um, and then the second again to the third. Um, okay, back into the basement. Um, so here we go. Now, if we're not going to repeat that um, that kind of 516 thing again, what are we going to do? So um, this is where I feel like often uh, contrasting something more unpredictable um, and potentially a little bit complex contrasting that with something simple uh, can give such an incredible effect because you have this kind of a uh, little bit of danger because uh, you're not really sure where it's going um, but then it kind of locks in and you create this this kind of like you know resolution so you have like the tension with this polymedia, like I don't know where that's going, and then it kind of locks in with this resolution, um, and you're gonna get that like throughout this whole thing. You're gonna get like four times with different notes. It's gonna be super cool. So this is what we decided. Um, after this, we're just gonna do this guy and this guy. So really simple, really really simple, um, and then it goes all weird again up here and syncopated, and then really simple again. So check this out. 
Okay. Then we were like, eh, it's a little bit too predictable. So we moved this last one onto the off beat. So it's right in the. So this is beat four. It's coming on the um, the middle of that beat there. So we we say four e and uh, that's how we count um, the sixteenth notes. So one e and uh, two e and a three e and a four e and a. Okay. Um, now check this out. Okay, and we were like, yep, yeah, that is the one. So we did the same thing here, and we did the same thing over here. Okay, so that is our whole thing now. What's going on here? There we go. Okay, so hopefully you can see it on one screen now. And already we were kind of thinking like, okay, this is, this is really, we're, we're kind of like in, in the, um, you know, the, the finishing little stretch now, um, because it's already sounding like a bass line. You can really hear, um, the value it's bringing to the song. Um, remember once again, do not put anything in your song that, people wouldn't miss if it wasn't there. So most of the time in popular music songs, uh, the bass is really more of a frequency, um, kind of filling out the low end. Um, that's a massive waste, okay? You want your bass to be an awesome melody that is getting stuck in people's heads as well, right? Don't miss the opportunity of making an incredible melody in, in the low end. Okay, so... Um, the one thing we were kind of feeling is like these little notes at the end here were a little bit kind of jumpy. We were like, okay, let's just like fill them out. Um, so they go nicely into the next one, into the next, um, the next note there. And we did the same there. So we did that with all of them. Um, cause we wanted to really have the same rhythm going through the whole thing because the notes are changing. So if the rhythm changes too, then suddenly it, it, it's like everything's changing. Um, that's difficult to follow. So we're changing the notes, so we want to keep the rhythm the same. So basically every four bar rhythm like this, um, whatever we end up with here, um, this is going to be the same every bar. So. Okay, and then we, we kind of felt the same actually with, with this guy here. We were like, actually this one should be long too. And that's just kind of thinking about, um, you know, the, the kind of, um, the live aspect of that, you know, um, I think it's always important when you're programming melodies, um, to kind of think about, you know, like visualize, um, visualize a bass player playing it. Um, you know, are they going to go like, bum, 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 bum. Right? No, that's kind of like more of a machine way of playing it. The bass player is going to go, ba bum bum, you know, like ba bum bum ba bum bum bum. Okay, obviously that was out of time, but ba bum bum, you know. So you're going to have like a, a nice combination of long notes and short notes. Same with this here. Like no bass player is going to play a little staccato, which is like a little bouncy note here into into that. You know, it's going to be like, bow, and then maybe even like it'll slide up or something. But um, so this felt much more natural um, to us. Um, if you're programming like a synth line, um, you don't need to necessarily think about how human, um, you know, it's sounding. Um, but having said that, I think uh, by doing this, you're always going to end up with a better melody um, because you are treating the melody um, as something that came from a human, um, which means it's going to have more feeling. Uh, so let's do the same with the other one. So uh, we filled out this guy. Mm, 
this one. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got them all filled out, so check this out. Okay, now we are looking very good. Uh, definitely in the finishing stretch now. So, uh, and once again, a lot of people would think like, okay, that's a wrap, that's the baseline. Um, no, definitely not. Okay, we have some huge issues here that still need uh, addressing. Um, so we, uh, oh, I've actually got, uh, I've got a melody checklist, um, which I use for all my melody writing, whether I'm doing bass lines, uh, vocals or anything. Um, so uh, that's in that uh, Hack Music Theory for Songwriting and Producing PDF on, on the website. So check that out and literally use it for all your melodies. They will all be great melodies if you go through that checklist. Uh, one of the things which is, um, it's one of my, one of my pet peeves in, uh, in a lot of popular music songs, in, in most popular music songs, is the um, the melodic movement of a perfect fourth or perfect fifth, um, and it the basically what happens is the the perfect fourth. So I'll give you an example. Um, this guy to this guy here. So the E up to the B. Okay, that's a perfect fifth. Um, so it's seven semitones, right? So that's E, and then it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to the B. Um, so that's a perfect fifth, um, and then a perfect fourth um, would be to the A here. So um, perfect fourth is uh, five semitones. So whenever you have the melodic movement, and that's very important, the melodic movement. So when, whenever you are writing a melody, like a bass line. When you go from one note, like this, and you go up or down, a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth, what you're doing is you're actually making use of an interval that is so similar in sound, um, in, in vibration, that a lot of non-musicians uh, can't even hear that those are two notes. So in other words, if you play E and B at the same time, um, let me, I'll do that on the, do on this guy here. Okay, so check this out. Especially when you kind of pull it out. It's really noticeable. So this is E and B. So that's the one and the five, the perfect fifth, and seven semitones in between. Check this out. As you can hear, um, it kind of sounds funny when you, you know, because they've done studies and, and found that uh, a lot of non-musicians hear that perfect fifth um, interval um, so when you play the two notes together, um, a lot of non-musicians can't hear that that's actually two notes. Um, this means that, uh, oh, the, the, the reason for that is because um, of the vibration. Um, it's very boring if you don't like science, um, but basically for every, uh, for every two vibrations of this E, this B is vibrating three times. Um, so the vibrations are so similar that they can be mistaken um, for being the same note. Uh, that's why they're called perfect, so perfect fourth, perfect fifth. It also happens with the octave, if you go from E up to the E. Um, that's the vibration of, for this guy doing one, this guy does two vibrations. So um, same thing most non-musicians um, can't hear that that's two notes. So perfect fourths and perfect fifths um, are fine in uh, in harmony, like when you're building chords to be playing them like a chord, you know, you've got one 
that would be like the flat three, the third note, um, in in the Dorian mode, and then five. So it's fine to play those um, within chords, but when you use it as a melodic movement, so when you go from the one up to the perfect fifth in a melody, the movement is so perfect um, that it's boring. There's no interest in that. So as a general rule of thumb, if you want to create really strong melodies where the movements are extremely colorful as opposed to the kind of perfect beige interval, right? Um, so if you want to create really colorful, strong intervals um, with all the notes moving from one to the next right through your melodies, um, which I imagine everyone wants to do that, then what you need to do is really avoid moving in perfect fourths and perfect fifths. Um, and, you know, whenever I, whenever I teach my students this, they're, you know, they're always saying, um, well, you know, some of them agree immediately. Um, and then some of them are like, well, you know, if you're not going to do, you know, if, if you're telling me not to do that, um, I'm going to do it. And it's like, of course you can do it. Um, it's just going to sound boring, you know? Um, and this is kind of like avoiding the melodic movement of perfect fourths and fifths. Uh, this is actually one of those rules that are there to help you make better music. Um, some rules are not meant to be broken, and obviously, you know, most rules are meant to be broken, but some are definitely not meant to be broken. Um, like, you know, when you're driving around, like, a elementary school, like a primary school, um, and there's kids playing, and you've got, like, the speeding signs, you know, saying, uh, you know, it's always, like, really kind of half the speed that you would feel comfortable driving, um, but those rules are for very good reasons, you know, because if a kid runs out into the road, you want to be going slow enough that you can just break. Um, so it needs to be extra slow. Avoiding fourths and fifths, avoiding perfect fourths and perfect fifths um, when you're making melodies, it's one of those rules, you know, do it for the the sake of your music, because um, it will always be better doing that. Um, and most excitingly, when you do that, you always end up with something that you totally didn't plan. Uh, you end up with something you would never do normally. Um, and this is one of the most uh, thrilling parts of writing a melody for me. Uh, and, and everyone I've talked to do this always, uh, they rejoice when they find a perfect fourth or perfect fifth like this here. So the E to the B, because what it means is we get to do something really interesting with this guy here, um, which if this melodic movement wasn't a perfect fifth, um, it, we would just be leaving it, right? Um, and you can already see, like here, that G to the A. That's that's great because it's it's a second G up to the A. So we're not going to do anything here. This is already done. So in a way, it's kind of like, well, you know, um, there's no need to do anything. Um, to this because it's already working, um, which is which is good, but this is way more fun here because um, this guy is a little a little troublemaker. So uh, we're gonna find a way more interesting place for him to live, um, and this is where we started actually. So we thought let's get this guy um, a nice big interval because uh, remember um, once again in the melody checklist I'm um, in that PDF so check it out, but uh, whenever you're writing melodies, um, there's um, a couple really important things that you want to be thinking about. Uh, the first one is to get a balance uh, of harmonic notes and non-harmonic notes. Okay, what the hell is a harmonic note? I know. Um, let me explain. So a harmonic note is a note that's in the harmony. So in other words, a note that's in the chord. Um, most of the time in popular music, um, we're talking about triads, one, three, five. Um, so a harmonic note is going to be the one, the three, or the five. 
harmonic notes sound really strong because they fit into the chord. Um, that's the good, the good side. Um, the downside is that using only harmonic notes, it's really boring because it just sounds like you're playing the same as the chords. Um, Non-harmonic notes are the notes that kind of fit in between those ones, so um, in in the holes, right? So one, three, five is harmonic notes, the chord. Non-harmonic notes are not in the chord, so that's the two, the four, the six, and the seven. So um, when a chord is playing, and you got the one, three, and the five, um, if you come along and play a two in that, it's going to sound really interesting because it doesn't really belong in there um, in the chord, but it belongs in the key, right? The whole scale, the mode. Um, same with the four, six, and the seven. So all great melodies have a balance of notes that are in the chord and notes that are not in the chord. And if you get this balance right, you always get a great melody. If you get it wrong, what's going to happen is too many harmonic notes is going to sound boring and too many non-harmonic notes is going to sound like you're playing a different song um, or your bass player is drunk. Um, uh, we don't want that. So what we did here is we chose to go up to that six. The reason we did that is because we're in the Dorian mode um, and that six from the E, it's C sharp. The six is that note that is the major six, right? So that note is that kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. So we really wanted to inject a bit of that optimism um, in the root triad, this E minor here. So uh, the other cool thing is that from here, from this note, the E up to that um, C sharp, so the one up to the six, uh, what, what happens is we get a really big interval. And that's another thing that you want to be thinking about when you are writing melody. Great melodies, once again, have a balance between small intervals and big intervals. So if all your intervals through a melody are just kind of around the same place, and it's going like, right, it's going to sound really boring because there's no range um, to your melody. On the other hand, um, when you're kind of playing or singing down here, and then suddenly you soar up, through like a really big interval like this, like a sixth, um, what happens is it really injects um, a huge amount of refreshment and life into that melody. Uh, so you always want to be using a combination of, you know, little intervals. And by little, we mean seconds and thirds. Um, and then combining that with big intervals. By big, we mean sixths and sevenths. Okay, you don't want to jump in octaves. You can do that in the bass because it's a way of, um, once again, um, it's kind of that trick that we did in the chords um, where we played through two different positions of that A major chord. So it sounds like you're getting another chord, but it's actually just a different position. So rearranging the notes of the same chord. Um, so in the bass, sometimes it's cool to play an octave as a way to do that. So for example, um, if we took this guy and we put him like up there, okay, that's okay. Um, it's okay to do that in the bass because um, it creates a rhythmic um, interest without changing the note. Um, and in the bass, we need to be very careful about moving away from the root. So there's all these kind of things. Basically, it's all about balance. Um, you need to balance harmonic notes and non-harmonic notes. You need to balance small intervals with big intervals. And you need to balance the amount that you stay on the root and the amount that you're not on the root. Um, the bass is obviously the foundation of the music. So the bass is at the very bottom of all the pitched content, all the melody and harmony, right? So the bass is your foundation. Um, when you're playing the root, it's nice and stable. 
when you move off the root, what happens is you create um, a bit of instability. Uh, and that's kind of where the magic is, you know, like you kind of, you know, you imagine this, this architecture, this musical architecture, and you kind of move, you know, the foundation and it's like, whoa, it's like thrilling, right? Um, it's dangerous. But then you kind of need to go back um, and keep everything safe, right? Because obviously, if you move around too much and you spend too little time on the route, then um, you're just going to lose your listener. They're going to be like, oh my God, you know, this musical architecture is is being demolished um, from the, the insecure foundation. Uh, so it's really important to to play that balance very carefully. Um, okay, that's a lot of talking. Let's get back to the melody. So um, here's what we did. We fixed this um, with a sick. Um, and then this one here, this is a good example. From the B down to the G. That was actually fine. Um, but we thought, you know what, because this one's moving, um, it's actually going to sound a bit boring if this guy doesn't move. So we were like, well... We'll just do a little fall into that, okay? Um, so that gives us the... Um, actually, there was another reason we did that. Undo that. Um, we actually decided... This guy here. We decided what we want to do is... Go down to the um, the D, which is a flat 7. Um, and actually now I remember that um, it because we went below the E, so this would actually have to be played on a D tune bass. Um, D tuning to D, um, which is called drop D um, in the kind of guitar and bass world. So drop D tuning is really common. Um, so I felt comfortable going to the D. Um, but I wouldn't have gone any lower than that because, um, you know, well, I mean, it depends because then you're getting into five string territory. But, um, you know, I wanted to keep this matching up with my six string guitar. So, um, so we wanted to drop to the flat seven, um, because flat sevens into the root. So that kind of, um, you almost think of that as like an eight, the one and the eight, same, the root note. And then flat sevens, like two semitones down. Whenever you have that movement, like, the root and then two semitones down to the flat seven, so the minor seven and then back. Um, that's like really what kind of funk is built on. That's in like the funk DNA. Um, and you can hear that as soon as you go down to that flat seven. It's like, okay, here we go, this is getting funky. And once again, as soon as we did that, we were like, oh my god, that's a motif. So we did it again over here. So this is the B, the root. We took this guy down to a flat seven as well. Check this out. And then that gets us back to this note. Um, then we were like, okay, well, this guy's going to sound awesome as a flat seven as well. So we pulled that down. Okay, um, and then here, um, we were actually thinking that, uh, because in the first two beats you can see nothing actually changes, right? So we were like, okay, that's going to stay. Um, and then this would have been a flat seven, um, but it's really important to kind of hit that A as the chord hits. Um, not always, but here we wanted to do that because we were emphasizing the A because it's that fourth chord in Dorian and that kind of really gives us that Dorian character, the um, the optimism. Um, so we didn't actually change anything here. But here we were like, okay, you are going to get us some funky flat seven action. So we took the A down to G here. Um, and it's another way of breaking up this 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 A, right? Because um, what happened in the chords, um, we actually uh, we split this, right? So we played this one, 
and then we replayed this one in that other position. So uh, we did the same thing in the base, the same kind of concept. Um, we dropped to the flat seven here. So you go back up to the root here, um, and it totally enlivens that um, that chord, even though it hasn't changed. So check this out. Okay, um, and then we're almost done. Um, so uh, here from A to D, okay, we have a um, an interval of five semitones. So the A, and then one, two, three, four, five. Okay, five semitones means perfect fourth. Um, boring, boring, boring beige interval. Okay, um, that's not going to be that's not going to be good enough for for our baseline. So um, what we decided uh, was we need to move this guy, um, and we actually played around with a bunch of options, and we decided we actually really liked the sound of the E coming down to the D. Okay, and this often happens. You're like, okay, that's awesome. And then we were like, oh man, the A to the E, we just basically created a perfect fifth, which is also an issue. Um, but we really like this note. Um, and whenever that happens, um, just kind of work your way backwards. So leave this note, let's just move this note um, to something that works. So all we did is we dropped this guy, this is the root, the A, we dropped him back down to a flat seven, um, that funky flat seven, right? It's another excuse to throw in a funky note. Um, and now from the flat seven up to the um, five, that E, so from the G up to the E, um, this is an interval of a sixth, um, which is also cool because this is a sixth interval, right? And this was a sixth interval. So we're kind of mirroring that big jump up there. And as you'll notice, we've got the six up here moving down a second, a melodic second. So we're just going from the C sharp to the B, the next note down. Uh, and that motif we do here as well. We go from the E, uh, which is the five over here. So we go from that, the E, down to the D which is the next note down. So we kind of got another little motif over there and that that we're repeating. Um, and that, I believe, is is everything. Uh, we did obviously always, um, and please remember to do this, um, always check your last note um, to the first note. So the tail of your melody always needs to work strongly, you know, the, the uh, melodic interval from the end note to the first note um, needs to be strong as well. And we have a D here and an E here. Uh, so that's the interval of a seventh. Um, we're going, that's basically the the D is like the minus seven over the E. Uh, so that's great. That's really strong. We don't have to do anything else. Um, and voila, done. Here it is. Have a listen. That's it. That's how to write a great bass line. Um, full of life, full of syncopation, balance between harmonic, non-harmonic notes, balance between small intervals, big intervals, um, just enough stability on the root um, to hold the foundation for all the music above it, um, but also just enough instability moving off the root um, to create that kind of that excitement. Um, and that's it. Until next video, happy songwriting. Right, now I've got some homework for you, aka hack work. I want you to write a bass line. No, no. I want you to write a great bass line. The way you're going to do that is by following that melody checklist. So use those hacks. You're going to create balance between harmonic notes and non-harmonic notes. You're going to create balance between small intervals and big intervals. And you're going to play around with the stability of those root notes and moving off them. 
Let us know how you get on in the comments below. And if you need any help, please grab the books and PDFs from our website at revolutionharmony.com. So there you have it. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're feeling inspired and empowered, please hit subscribe below so we can do it all again next week.